كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الذين ينفقون أموالهم بالليل والنهار بالليل والنهار سرا وعلانية فلهم أجرهم عند ربهم ولا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون صدق الله العلي العظيم Dear brothers and sisters, illuminate your hearts and minds and this majlis with the recitation of salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. You find that Muslims and followers of Ahlul Bayt around the world dedicate 10 nights a year in some cases a month or two full months towards the mourning and aza and remembrance of Imam al Hussein, peace be upon him. However, we have a figure who is neglected by the followers of the Ahlul Bayt, and that's his brother Imam Hassan al Mushtaba, peace be upon him. In fact, last night after the majlis, while we were eating communally, someone mentioned this. Why is it? That the Shia, the followers of Ahlul Bayt, we neglect Imam al Hassan, Imam Hassan al Mujtaba. We rarely pay any attention. There's rarely any remembrance of Imam Hassan al Mujtaba. This is despite the fact that Imam al Hussein, peace be upon him, on the day of Ashura, when speaking to his sister Lady Zainab, what did he tell her? He told her, Wa akhi khayrun minni. He told her, My brother, Imam al Hassan, is greater than me. Imam al Hussein is acknowledging that his elder brother, Imam al Hassan, is greater than him. So, such a figure is a figure worthy of remembrance, worthy of study, critical analysis. There is a hadith in Sahih al Bukhari in which Abu Huraira he narrates. He says, Every time I see Hassan al Mushtaba, the grandson of Rasulullah, I begin to cry. They ask him, Why, Abu Huraira? He says, Because years ago, while Rasulullah was walking in the markets of Medina, the markets of Bani Qaynuqa', a Jewish tribe, after he completed, he went to the Masjid, Masjid al Nabawi in Medina, the prophetic mosque in Medina. As he was sitting, entered Imam Hassan al Mushtaba, the young child. I saw him running towards Rasulullah, his grandfather. And when he arrived, he fell into his lap, and Rasulullah embraced him. He began to hug him, he began to kiss him. He says, every time I see Hassan al Mujtaba, I remember that scene and I begin to cry. Imam Hassan al Mujtaba was known for various traits. However, one of his titles is Karim Ahl al Bayt. He is the generous one among the Ahl al Bayt. And inshallah, tonight we will discuss lessons that we are able to learn from the life of Imam al Hassan and especially from the generosity of Imam al Hassan. But before that, a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Inshallah, we will be discussing four traits tonight, bi idhnillah. The first lesson that we learn from the life of Imam al Hassan and his generosity is that when you give, when you offer charity for the sake of Allah, there needs to be sincerity in your giving. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states on the Holy Quran, إِن تُبْدُ الصَّدَقَاتِ فَنِعَمَّا هِي وَإِن تُخْفُوهَا وَتُؤْتُوهَا الْفُقَرَاءِ فَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ وَيُكَفِّرْ عَنْكُمْ مِنْ سَيَّآتِكُمْ وَاللَّهُ بِمَا تَعْلَمُونَ خَبِيرٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states on the Holy Quran, if you give sadaqat, if you give charity, then that's well. Meaning, if you give charity in front of people. However, if you secretly, not publicly, if you secretly give charity, that's even better. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will compensate you for what you have given. You find from the life of Imam al-Hassan, 
This lesson is beautifully exhibited through his actions. Many of us, unfortunately, why is the reason? What's the motivation for us to give? You find many of us, we want accolades. We want praise. Right? When we give, we expect a plaque of thank you. We expect our name to be plastered on some kind of building. We expect something to be given in return. Whereas you find Imam al-Hassan, peace be upon him, when he would give, he would give with utmost sincerity. There's a story that says Abu Sufyan, every single day he would offer a walima. He would go inside a hall in Mecca. He would invite all of his friends. He would slaughter a sheep and they would have communal meal. But who was invited? Whenever a, an orphan or a needy person would come, he would reject them. He would only invite the other big shots, the other VIPs. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say about that? أَرَأَيْتَ الَّذِي يُكَذِّبُ بِالدِّينَ فَذَلِكَ الَّذِي يَدُعُّ الْيَتِيمِ do you see the one who lies in the name of religion? He's the one who pushes away the orphan. He would invite people to feed them, not for the way of Allah, not out of generosity. He wants wajaha. He wants a certain stature in society. He wants people to say, oh, you know, the meal is with Abu Sufyan. He's the one sponsoring this. Right? He wants that recognition. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he commands us and instructs us to give, this is not the method of giving. Allah subhanahu wa states in the Holy Quran, Some people when they give, they want other people to look. They want the praise of others. And these people don't believe in Allah and the Day of Judgment. The hadith of Rasulullah and the Imams emphasize secretly giving so much to the extent there's a hadith that says when you extend your hand to give to a poor person, your other hand should not be aware. That's how secretive you should be with your ata, with your giving. Amir al-Mu'mineen, peace be upon him, every single night he would roam around the streets of Kufa. He would knock on doors. He would carry these ginormous bags on his back. He would knock on doors and give to those who were in need. And no one ever knew until when? Until the night he was martyred. After that, those people who were receiving this aid, they saw this man, this mysterious man, who every single night would come. He's no longer coming. After the martyrdom of Amir al-Mu'mineen, when the aid stopped, they finally figured out this was Amir al-Mu'mineen, Imam Ali. But yet during his life, he never told anyone. And he would purposely go at night so that no one would figure it out. You find, in fact, research supports that when you give, especially when you give privately, this increases your own happiness. A study conducted by the University of Zurich found that those who tended to have higher levels of giving, higher levels of donation, of charity, correlated with higher levels of life satisfaction and happiness. In an article in the journal Nature Communication, these scientists they gave people $100. They told them, within the next week, we want you to spend it. And then they wrapped some wires around their head. They placed them inside an MRI. What they found is that people who would give charity, a certain region of the brain was activated, known as the temporal parietal junction. When this area is active, that's usually at the time that you're giving. What's associated with this? Higher levels of dopamine. It's a hormone that makes you feel good increased level of happiness and lower levels of cortisol, which is a stress hormone. So when you give, this region in the brain activates, not only does your happiness go up, your level of stress goes down. SubhanAllah. It's as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has hardwired into the human biology the incentive to give. When you give, not only does the other person benefit, your own happiness and life satisfaction increases. According to a study cited by the Atlantic, studies across all nations, all cultures, have shown that those who volunteer, and by the way, volunteering is a type of giving. It's not giving your money, but rather giving your time. This is another form of ata, another form of giving. Across all countries and cultures, 
higher levels of volunteering is associated with higher levels of happiness. This is the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you want to seek happiness, ironically, you don't spend on yourself. You spend on others, whether it's with your time or with your money. And that's why we have the saying, in ahsantum, ahsantum li anfusikum. If you do good, it's as if you did good to yourself. When you spend on others, when you spend your time on others, what happens? It's your own happiness that goes up and your own stress that goes down. In an article in the International Journal of Research and Marketing, they found that on average, people who gave donations in private experienced upwards of 16% higher levels of happiness than those who gave donations in public or that requested recognition in return for their donations. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Allah says in the verse that we mentioned, it's okay to give in public, but what's even better is that you give in private, in secrecy. The hadith states when you give with your right hand, your left hand should not know about it. Number two, another feature from the life of Imam al-Hassan, peace be upon him, that we ought to learn from, is that when you give, don't feel that you're the superior individual. Some people, when they give, they feel, I'm so superior that I'm giving you. It's a favor that I'm bestowing upon you. And sometimes they even insult the other individual. This is incorrect, my dear brothers and sisters. If you go and you're passing out food or you're giving someone aid, some people, what do they like to do? They take the camera, they take a picture and post it on Instagram. My dear brothers and sisters, this is wrong. You're stripping away the dignity, the honor of that individual. You're belittling that other individual, making them feel small. This is not acceptable in Islam. Some people, what do they do? If a beggar or someone asking for aid comes, they take out a dollar, you know, some pocket change in their pockets. Five dollars, if you really want to do good, maybe twenty dollars, right? And they give it to the person and they say, go. You know, please don't bother me again. This is incorrect. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Holy Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, O you who believe, لا تبطلوا صدقاتكم بالمن والأذى. O you who believe, don't nullify, don't invalidate your charity by bothering the other individual, by belittling them, by constantly reminding them that you're superior. Doing this will invalidate your charity. You will not receive the rewards of your charity. This is a way to nullify it. Some people, especially if it's someone you see often, every time they see them, Ah, huh, John, how are you doing? You need, you need aid again? Remember that time I helped you two weeks ago? This is wrong. The Quran says, once you give, that's it. Don't even mention the subject again. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you your reward. Stop asking for more recognition, for more praise. Once Imam Hassan al-Mushtaba, peace be upon him, was sitting inside his house, someone, a needy individual, came inside the house to ask for aid. As this man was walking, before he even had a chance to speak, Imam al-Hassan looked at his servant, Qambar, and he told him, go, bring some money for this man. This man was shocked. He said, oh, Imam al-Hassan, I didn't even ask you. You didn't even give me a chance to speak. Imam al-Hassan said, I don't even need you to speak. I don't want you to have to throw away the water of your face, right? As we say, ma wujjak, by having to ask. Before the person even asks, you should give. You should start that action. Don't wait until the other person has to belittle themselves. They have to come, they have to beg, they have to ask, and then you give. We have to learn from Imam Hassan that you should just give without asking, without belittling the other person. Number three, another feature of Imam Hassan al-Mushtaba, peace be upon him, is that when he would give, he wouldn't just check in his pockets how many cents, how many dollars he has. When he would give, he would give a large amount. Such that the hadith states, he would remove poverty from the other person. The hadith states, إِذَا أَعْطَى فَقِيرًا أغناه. If he gives someone money who is a poor person, he removes the affliction of poverty from them. That's how much he would give. Unfortunately, my dear brothers and sisters, some of us, we have this condition where we don't like to see those who are less privileged those who are needy, those who are facing and struggling with poverty, to enjoy simple luxuries. Right? If we see someone who is going undergoing poverty or struggles, 
They receive aid, let's say, from the government. If they go one, one vacation a year, what is this? You're undeserving of this. If they buy one piece of new furniture, you don't need all this. Why are we spending so much money on you? قُلْ مَنْ حَرَّمَ زِينَةَ Allah. Allah states, who has forbidden the luxuries and adornments of Allah? Even a poor person, don't they desire good food? Simple vacations, simple luxuries. There's nothing wrong with that. So when you give, some people say, you know what, I'll give just, so, just enough so that they could buy bread today. Imam al-Hasan, peace be upon him, when he would give, the hadith states, he would give until the other person is removed from poverty. The hadith states, Imam al-Hasan, during his life, three times he split his wealth in half and would give half for the way of Allah. And twice in his life, kharaja an malih. He gave everything he owned for Allah. Three times he split his wealth in half and gave half away. And twice in his life, he gave everything he owned. This is the way of Imam al-Hasan, peace be upon him. Kareem Ahlul Bayt. The generous one among the Ahlul Bayt. Once, a companion came up to Imam Hassan al mushtaba He told him, Sayyidi wa Mulai, my master, I have an enemy. The Imam said, who's your enemy? Who's the one that's bothering you? He said, I have an enemy that shows no mercy to the young or to the old, to male or to female, to Arab or non-Arab. The Imam asked him, who is this enemy that's troubling you? He said, poverty. He said, as much as I try, I seem unable to remove myself from poverty. So the Imam said, wait a second. He went, he gathered some funds for this man, he gave him some funds and he said, if this enemy ever afflicts you again, don't hesitate to come to us, the Ahlul Bayt. We will fight this enemy for you. Meaning what? Anytime you find yourself in need, you can come to us. Some of us, you say, here, take this money, I don't want to see you again. Imam al-Hasan has an open door. Anytime you need help, you need aid, you can find comfort in seeking aid with Imam al-Hasan, peace be upon him. Once Imam Hassan al mushtaba was walking in Medina, he happened to walk by the wall of a garden, of a farm owned by one of the companions of Rasulullah. Outside the walls of the garden, he found a slave eating some food after doing a lot of manual labor. From a distance, he could see that every time this slave would eat some bread, he would take a bite, he would rip some bread. There was a dog by him. He would feed the dog. He would take a bite, rip some bread, feed the dog. Take a bite, rip some bread, feed the dog. This gesture really moved Imam al Hassan. He went to this man. He asked him, why are you doing this? Why are you feeding this dog? This man, look at the response of this slave. He says, I'm embarrassed to eat and not another person watches me who's hungry. I'm embarrassed to eat and something which has a soul is watching me and is hungry. The Imam said, wait here, wait here a couple moments. He went, he inquired as to the owner of this farm and the owner of the slave. He went to him, he said, I wish to purchase this farm, this garden and this slave from you. What's your price? The man named this price. The imam purchased the garden and the slave. He came back a few moments later. He told the slave, I went to the owner. I've purchased this land and I've purchased you. As for you, you are free. And as for this land, I grant you the ownership of this land. Subhanallah. Within less than an hour, this man went from being a slave, a poor slave, to being a free man who is wealthy and who has land and property waiting for him. This is the generosity of Imam al Hassan al Mushtaba, peace be upon him. In another story, the hadith states. The Hassanan, Imam al Hassan and Imam al Hussein, and their cousin Abdullah bin Ja'far bin Abi Talib. These three were walking in the desert, they were traveling. They were traveling through the desert. In the distance, they see a tent. They come by the tent, they knock, they find an old lady inside the tent. The lady, after she finds out who these are, these are the grandsons of Rasulullah and the grandson of Abu Talib. She invites them over for a meal. She had one sheep. 
she slaughtered that sheep and she prepared a meal for them. After they were done, Imam al-Hasan told her, if you ever find yourself in Medina, you will be my guest. A few minutes later, the husband of this lady, he was working outside. He comes back after the Imam and his brother and his cousin departed. He comes, he sees the sheep is gone. So he asks his wife, where did the sheep go? She told him the grandsons of Rasulullah came and I offered them a meal. Now this man, he got angry. He started nagging. Why did you do that? You know, we don't have too much. We're always struggling with poverty. Why would you do this? We needed that sheep. We're in more need than them. And he began to nag and nag and nag. Several weeks later, this couple, this elderly couple, they visited Medina to buy some basic essentials, some staples. Now while walking, this lady from the distance, she spotted Imam al-Hasan. When his eyes laid on her, he immediately recognized her. So he went, he invited her, they, he offered them a meal, this elderly couple, the elderly lady and her husband. After the meal, he said to thank you for your graciousness, even though you didn't have to offer us a meal, even though you yourself are struggling. He said, I want to offer you 1,000 sheep as a reward for what you had done. And then he told her, go to my brother Hussein. Afterwards, she went to, to the Imam's brother, Imam al Hussein, peace be upon him. He also offered them 1,000 sheep. Imam al Hussein said, also go visit my cousin Abdullah bin Ja'far. They went, they visited Abdullah bin Ja'far, and he also offered them 1,000 sheep. In return for one sheep, what did they get? 3,000 sheep. This is the generosity of Ahlul Bayt. You give one, they return the favor 1,000 times. This is the generosity of the Ahlul Bayt. Even if we can't reach the level of giving that Imam al Hassan exhibits, we ought to try to do our best. Once a companion came and asked Imam al Hassan, he said, Oh Imam, why do you give so much? You give and give and give until you have no money left. Such that the hadith we stated earlier, he split his money three times in his life and he gave away all his money twice. So he said, Why do you give so much? The Imam responded, I've made it a habit that when people are in need of me, I give them, I don't refuse them. Anytime someone is in need and they come to me, it's my habit that I never refuse them. And Allah has made it a habit with me, whenever I am in need, Allah never refuses me. I've never asked Allah once and He's refused me. So I am afraid that if I break my habits with people, if people come to me during their times of need and I refuse them, I might find myself one day in need of Allah and Allah will refuse me. This is the akhlaq, this is the character of Imam al Hassan, peace be upon him. Allahu Akbar. He says, I never break my habits so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not break his habit with me. And we ought to, earn, to learn a lesson here, dear brothers and sisters. If people are in need, don't refuse them, don't reject them. Because at the end of the day, our sustenance comes from Allah. We might think it's our hard work, and yes, like we mentioned yesterday, we ought to put in the hard work, we have to go to work early, we have to be creative. But at the end of the day, sustenance comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If He decides to cut it, so if you make it a habit to aid people in their times of need, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will aid you in your time of need. Number four, the fourth trait, and inshallah the last trait that we will discuss tonight, of Imam al-Hassan, peace be upon him, is that he would give to anyone and everyone. He would give indiscriminately. Amir al-Mu'mineen, the Quran states two Asir, two war captives, came and knocked on his door and he gave them everything they had that night. Two Asir, two war captives, they weren't even Muslim. They came, they knocked on the door of Amir al Mu'mineen and all the food they had that night. The blessed household of Amir al-Mu'mineen, Imam Ali, Lady Fatima and the Hassanain, all the food they had, they gave it to them, despite them not even being Muslim. 
Dear brothers and sisters, you don't have to be Muslim or non-Muslim or from your own ethnicity or tribe to give to anyone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even to the fasiq, right? Even the non-believer, the one who is a fasiq, he gives this air that we breathe. The resources of this earth. You find there are people who are wealthy who are well off. They're not necessarily believers. They're not Muslim even. But Allah gives them. Allah from His generosity, He didn't decide to bar anyone from His blessings. So who are we to say that I only give to the Muslim? I only give to the mu'min. I only give to someone from my country, from my tribe, from my village. This is incorrect. This is not the way and the path of Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. Once the Prophet Ibrahim, peace be upon him, he was inside his house. He had prepared a meal for himself and his family. A stranger who was visiting town, he had nowhere to go. So he came by the house of Prophet Ibrahim. And of course, the Prophet being the generous man that he is, he invited him, he hosted him, and he invited him for a meal. Now as they were about to eat, of course, the Prophet Ibrahim begins his meal with what? The remembrance of Allah. Now the other man, he was a mushrik, he was not a believer. So as they say, he just dug right in. He began to eat. The Prophet became very offended. How can you eat despite you being a creation of Allah without thanking Allah? So he kicked him out of the house. Moments later, who descends? Jibra'il. He says, Oh Ibrahim, Allah is disappointed in you. Allah is angry. Why did you kick out his servant, his slave? He says, he speaks to Allah, he says, Oh Allah, well he, he didn't thank you. And that offended me. He said, Ibrahim, for 40 years, this man never thanked me once. He never mentioned my blessings upon him and yet every single day, day in and day out for 40 years, I granted him sustenance. Now just once he didn't mention my name in your presence and you kicked him out. So when Prophet Ibrahim heard this, he went running after the man. He invited him back again and then they started to eat. After the meal, the man said, if you don't mind, I want to ask a question. When I first came in, you were very welcoming. I was about to eat, you kicked me out. And now you invite me back in. What's going on? Prophet Ibrahim told him. He told him, at first you offended me, but then my Lord, he disciplined me. He said, you, even though 40 years without thanking Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given you sustenance, I should learn in that path. That even if you don't thank Allah, I should still be the one who is worthy of giving and give you. He said, if your Lord taught you that, I would like to worship that Lord. And that day, he became a believer in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it doesn't matter who the person is. A companion of Imam al-Hasan once came upon him. He said, oh Imam, how do I know if the other person is deserving? A lot of us have this kind of mentality. You know, they say these people that beg on the streets or that come asking for aid, they're not deserving. They should go work. They should do this, this, that. How do I know they're really poor? What was the answer of Imam al-Hasan to this kind of mentality? He said, true, even if the other person is not deserving, they're not a worthy recipient of your aid. They're not truly poor or they could work, whatever the reason is. Even if they're not a worthy recipient, you should become a worthy giver. Doesn't matter what the other person is. Don't look at the other person. You should be generous. You should develop that quality and virtue of generosity and you be a worthy giver who cares if the other person is poor or not that's none of your business that's between them and allah your job is to do what is to be a worthy giver that's why in the dua what do we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if al bi ma anta ahlu we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala oh allah what do we say? Treat me the way I deserve to be treated? Because if Allah wants to treat us the way we deserve to be treated, we sin every single day. Many of us commit all kinds of vices every single day. If we want to be treated the way we deserve to be treated in the eyes of Allah, Allah will give us the worst of treatment. What do we ask Allah? If albi ma anta ahlu. Treat me the way that you are worthy of treating me. Allah, it's from His magnanimity, it's from His karam, His generosity that He treats us well. Likewise, if someone comes to you asking for aid, 
Who cares what's the situation of the other person? That's between them and Allah. You be the worthy giver and give them. You become ahlun lil khair. Even if they're not ahlun lil musa'ada, they're not worthy recipients, you become ahlun lil khair, a worthy giver. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And thus, my dear brothers and sisters, we must learn from Imam Hassan al-Mushaba, from the way he exhibits the virtue of generosity, that you should give. Firstly, try to give in secrecy, not in public. Number two, remember that you are not superior to the one you're giving. In fact, you should thank the person you give aid to. Because what? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will compensate you multiple times whatever you give. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you an incredible amount of ajr and reward for the small amount that you give the other individual. Try to give, not pocket change. We can't be like the imam and give a thousand sheep, right? But try to give something that will actually make a difference in the other person's life. And lastly, don't ask about the identity, about the eligibility of the other person, the other counterpart. Just give. If they're not a worthy recipient, you are a worthy giver. Or you should try to be a worthy giver. We ought to learn from the generosity of Imam al-Hasan, who would give such that three times in his life, he split all his wealth, and twice in his life, he gave all his wealth. But my dear brothers and sisters, Ata giving is not only material. And we find that Imam al-Hasan, peace be upon him, perhaps his greatest Ata, his greatest form of giving is what? Not his wealth, not his money, not his sheep. His son Qasim. The greatest ata that Imam al Hassan ever gave and that history records till today, 1,400 years later, is his son Qasim, his young boy. Qasim was two or three years old when his father died, when Imam al Hassan was poisoned and martyred. Thus, he grew up under the tutelage, under the mentorship of who? Of his uncle, Imam al Hussein, peace be upon him. It was Imam al Hussein who raised him, who taught him his virtues. It was Imam al Hussein who molded him into the bright star that would shine so brightly on the day of Ashura. The day before Ashura, after Imam al Hussein spoke to his companions and his family, and he told them, that what awaits tomorrow is inevitable death and martyrdom. Qasim, Al Qasim ibn al Hassan, he came up to his uncle. What did he ask him? He said, Ya Ammah, my dear uncle, Wahal ana mimman uqtal? Am I going to be among those who are killed? Will I die tomorrow? Now imagine, he's an 11 or a 12 year old asking his uncle, Will I die tomorrow? How does Imam al Hussein have the heart to tell him? What does the Imam tell him? He wants to test him. He wants to see what he's made of. He says, Ya Bunay, my dear son, How do you find death? How do you see death? The answer that Qasim gives, Wallah, he shakes my core to this day. He says, Ya Am, Al Mawtu Fika Ahla Min Al Asal. My dear uncle, death for you is sweeter than honey. This is an 11 or a 12 year old. What kind of mentorship did the Imam give him such that he exhibits these qualities? The night passes and the day of Ashura arrives. My dear brothers and sisters, Al Qasim sees the body of Ali al Akbar laying. He sees the body of Abel Fadl al-Abbas on the ground. He sees the bodies of all the companions scattered around the desert. He can't handle it anymore. He goes to his mother Ramla. He goes and he farewells her for the last time. It's as if he tells her, if you ever see youth again, please remember me. And if you ever drink water again, remember me. After he leaves the tent of the woman, he goes to his uncle, Al Imam Al Hussein, peace be upon him. He goes, he asks him for permission to fight. 
Now for all the other companions, all the other family members of the Ahlul Bayt, they would insist and after a few times he would accept for them to go fight. But for Qasim, he gave an absolute no. He told him, Qasim, you're all that I have left from my brother Imam Al-Hassan. How can I let you go? And you're such a young man. You're 11 years old. How can I let you go fight? And your mother is waiting for you in the tents. Al-Qasim, when he hears that, he falls at the feet of Imam al Hussein. He begins kissing the feet of Imam al Hussein. He pleads with him. He begs with him, my uncle, please. Just like the way your son Ali al-Akbar and Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas and the rest gave their life for you, I want to give my life for you. After a while, they begin to hug and they begin to cry. They cry so much such that the hadith states they both fell unconscious. This is the only time on the day of Ashura Imam al-Husayn falls unconscious. Eventually Imam al-Husayn, he grants him permission to go and fight. He wears his armor. He wears the turban of his father, Imam al Hassan, peace be upon him. He mounts the horse and he goes towards the enemies. As he's heading towards the enemies, the enemies look at him, they don't recognize him. They began to whisper, who is this? Is this another son of Imam al Hussein? We don't recognize him. Al Qasim ibn al Hassan recites these awesome words. إن تنكروني فأنا نجل الحسن صبط النبي المصطفى والمؤتمن هذا حسين كالأسير المرتهن وسط أناس لا سقوا صوب المزن. He says, if you do not recognize me, I am the son of Rasul, the grandson of Rasulullah, the son of Hassan. Imam Al Hussein, my master, is surrounded by the enemies, and I am here to fight you. Al Qasim ibn Al Hassan, despite his young age, he fights like a warrior. He fights valiantly. He begins to kill some of the enemies. Umar ibn Sa'ad says, the only way we can overpower him is if we surround him. He tells the other enemies to surround him. As Al-Qasim is fighting, Al-Qasim ibn Al-Hasan, the strap on his sandal is undone. As he bends over to fix his strap, O believers, an enemy comes from behind and he strikes the head of Al-Qasim. He falls from his horse onto the sand. Now usually, Whenever a companion, whenever a family member of Imam al Hussein would fall, they would look to the tents and yell out, Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. But Al Qasim, he was a child. He looked towards the tents and he said, Amma hadrikni. My uncle, please save me. Imam al Hussein, he hears out the cries of his nephew. He rushes, he rushes like a lion. He arrives at the body of Al Qasim, but by then it was too late. His soul had departed his body. He carries the body of Al Qasim. He places it in his lap and he says, <laughs> He says, Ya Uzzu ala ammika an tunadihi fala yujibuk, aw yujibuka fala yughni. He says, it's difficult upon the hearts of your uncle that you cry out for his help and he cannot answer you or that he answers you and that he is not able to help you. He begins to drag the body of Al Qasim. He places it by the body of his son Ali al Akbar. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi rajiun. فسيعلم الذين ظلموا آل محمد أي منقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين حبيبي